Today we can take a photo of our lunch and post it to Instagram easier than almost anything. It's effortless, and because the software, especially that type of consumer software, is just top notch. But isn't it weird that we go to work and we don't get that level of quality? We're still emailing spreadsheets around or getting on the phone. Now, let's take it further to the battlefield. The world's greatest fighting forces, the United States Department of Defense, they don't have that level of quality of software. And not only does it cost them billions in lost productivity, but when it actually comes to our troops, it can and does cost lives. That's why today we're talking with the co-founder of Addyton, James Boyd. After multiple tours of duty, he spent years working early at Palantir on the forward deployed teams that landed and expanded the seven and eight figure enterprise contracts that helped build Palantir. And he's doing it again with his new startup that is delivering apps like this one. Muster is the online identity and communication platform that's spreading fast across the US military. Aditan is proving that you can build highly profitable, high growth businesses in defense tech by building products that matter, that create value with impact and make the world safer and more stable. Defense tech is on the rise and James and his team are on the forefront. Let's get started. I guess to start off, I'd love to ask about how you started working on this kind of software. Like, how did you come to realize this was what was really needed by the armed forces? Well, thanks, Gary. I uh, appreciate you having me. And, and thank you also for, for your service in kind of creating an ecosystem around defense technology as well. Yeah, I mean, I guess that at the end of the day, this is a very personal thing that we're actually doing here. Uh, I guess it was 2018. October timeframe, 2018. And my brother had just gotten back from Afghanistan where he'd been out in Eastern Afghanistan in the valleys out there blocking ISIS. So their whole unit is focused on preventing the resupply of ISIS elements through Pakistan. And he's telling me about the experience he had out there where he was in firefights and he's using, uh, he's working with his whole team in these firefights and they're working to to try and block and to, to run interference on the ISIS elements. And he needs some help. And he's got this army issued device and they've ripped out the Wi-Fi chips and they've ripped out the LTE chips. So you have this army issued Android device and he's trying to use that to coordinate with the rest of his team and to call for air support. And these are and really, he's under really fire at that moment. Absolutely. Yeah. He's in a firefight and he's trying to call for, for air support, which is really, really essential in these kinds of situations. And because the army's removed these chips, and you have to, because frankly, mobile is a really difficult thing in this kind of environment. You have all the security challenges, you have connectivity challenges, you have the whole compliance challenge as well. He realizes that he can actually send WhatsApp messages to his Afghan partner force. So he's like sending text messages in a firefight saying, hey, you guys got to go to the left, you got to go to the right. And he's finding that, hey, when it comes time to actually talk to the US personnel, he can't actually do that. And I'm listening to this. And I'm hearing how they have the comms set up. And I'm realizing that, you know, you listen as a brother and like, this is something that's very, very painful to hear because you don't want to think of your loved ones in harm's way. And I'm listening as somebody who used to wear the uniform. I was a special forces soldier. And you think about your friends that are also in the same kind of situation. And then you also hear this as an engineer and you're like, wait a minute, why are we trying to push grid coordinates over a 16 kilohertz voice channel? Like this is not the right solution for the problem. And you realize, hey, somebody actually has to do something about it. And, you know, I think you look in the mirror and Gary, you've done a video where you talk about creating value in the world. And what's the unique value that you're actually able to create? And I kind of look in the mirror and say, hey, look, you're a special forces combo soldier. You were trained to be an expert in understanding austere military communications. I've had the opportunity to work at Palantir where I work with first class software engineers. We built amazing products and we've also created huge enterprise businesses working closely in partnership with special operations command to deliver amazing capabilities out there. And you realize, Hey, there's not too many other people in the world that can go and do this stuff. And so you feel a sense of responsibility to go and do this. I guess I really feel that because there's just this fundamental need, especially for an armed forces that in a lot of ways gets the best tech, right? But for software, for the software piece to fall down so thoroughly, 
um, and for something that, you know, you and I sort of just take for granted, you know, in our civilian work, it's a matter of just opening up Slack and being able to talk to people, right? But for to, to realize, oh, that's not actually a thing that is accessible to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, you know, in their normal work because of, you know, probably really good reasons too, right? I mean, security and compliance are all of these things that are really quite important, but you are sort of very uniquely blessed by having built the systems that got all the way through those sort of, you know, these are all, you know, checkpoints that the DOD has had that you've helped shepherd, you know, at Palantir. So to look at that and say, I can build the software, I can also get it sold and, you know, deployed in, in the hands of the troops and people who need it. Uh, that's a really big responsibility. It's something that we feel, you know, this is, it extends beyond like, yeah, we're, we're building products that make a real impact on end users. We have units that use our software and say, hey, like this is, your software has kept service members alive because of what you built. But there's this also other responsibility, which is actually setting an example for others. You know, there's this wealth of innovation that came from the first generation of the defense industrial base. You think about everything that happened in the 70s. You had the interplay between the universities with industry, with venture capital, and you created all the technology that powers the internet, Siri, AI, uh, and went on to, to create the kind of amazing hardware that we see in the DoD with stealth fighters and things like that. But it's time actually to, to really catalyze the next generation of an ecosystem where we can take this amazing technology that Silicon Valley builds, where we have these phenomenal engineers, phenomenal designers. You have deeply motivated people and like liquid pools of capital, which is seeking an opportunity. And we can actually say, hey, let's combine these forces again and let's actually bring around the software revolution in the DoD. So I think that's when uh, we first, you know, sort of reconnected. Uh, you know, obviously both of us were old friends from Stanford and uh, sort of you went on to uh, a career in special forces and Palantir. And then I happened to be at Palantir very early and then had left to go start companies. It was just really cool to hear from you in 2019. And that was sort of the first time I was frankly just really surprised that there weren't more real options. You know, the same reason why Palantir exists and sells to the very important parts of the government even today is because you know, large portions of the government and like some of the biggest companies in the world, they just don't have access to good software, period. Certainly. I remember when JJ and I first came up to meet you, I think it was in, in January of 2019. We didn't know anything about venture capital at the time. And you were educating us about venture capital. And we also were, I think, teaching you about the way things actually shake out in the Department of Defense, where we take take for granted that I can Slack and I can video chat and I have email and I have calendar and it's all on my phone and it's ubiquitous. And and that's just not the way the world works with the DOD. The DOD is still powered by notebooks, pen and paper, and clipboards. And really, there's this huge opportunity to, to create this transformation and actually make the shift to mobile and shift to digital, generate all this data that creates a lot of visibility and insight for the enterprise and uh, the kind of information that leaders need to make decisions, but also creates this deeply uh, satisfying, high-quality software experience for end users. And I think that this presents an opportunity to really show the world that uh, you can do startups in the defense sector, that you can take a bottoms up approach to this and change the way some of the procurement happens as well. So that, that, that sort of led you to build um, the first version of the product, which is called Muster. Talk, talk to me about that. I mean, it sounds like there was already sort of a very impressive um, case study that has come out of uh, real live active army brigades using it. Yeah, uh, we spent probably a year building the underlying technology. And like, this is not very sexy, I think, for, for most folks to think about security and compliance and connectivity. Like, these are not sexy things. Identity, messaging, like sort of the things that you would expect um, for a consumer app that allows people to communicate and collaborate. Oh, totally. If you wanted to just go build an application for consumers to, to send cat pictures, you're going to go over to Google Firebase and like life's going to be really, really easy. But when you start layering on the DOD compliance regulations, it becomes much, much harder. And you start thinking about nation state actors trying to penetrate software. It's, it's, a, it's a significant challenge for the developer. And so we built out Muster as the first product launched on top of this technology stack. And we focused on a core workflow for the Department of Defense, and that's personnel accountability. And this is not something that we think about in the private sector. You know, you sign into Slack and you know that your people are okay. But in the DOD, you have this highly distributed workforce. 
And we've got dozens of using, units using it right now. And this very, very prominent example was an army brigade was using it over the holiday period. And if folks remember Christmas Day 2020, there was a bombing that occurred in Nashville. So when I talk about a brigade, I mean you have 3,000 personnel that are sprinkled around the country. And because it's over the holiday period, you have about five personnel that are responsible for the safekeeping, the administration, the care, the management of these distributed personnel. And so using muster, they were able to get what they refer to as accountability, which means that they know that every single person is okay in a period of 30 minutes. And this is not a real number. When we tell people about this, military leaders say, hey, 30 minutes, that's not possible. It cannot be done. Because the way that they do it today, the status quo, is it's lining people up and counting them. Or if people are remote, it's you have the, the colonel calls the major, the major calls the captains, the captains call the sergeants, the sergeants call the corporals, and you have a giant phone tree. You have text message chains that are extremely long. And actually pulling the data back in real time, getting visibility in real time and understanding this is supremely difficult. And so what we've done is we digitize this fundamental military process and the fundamental military orders giving process where when somebody issues an instruction, they know that that instruction has been received and it's being actioned. So what you see with muster is that any organization that has a large span of control, we've turned it into three clicks to actually get personnel accountability across this distributed workforce in a fundamentally structured interaction where you can see there's actual progress being made across thousands of personnel. And it allows you to aggregate and automatically drill down to see the people that actually need help. So when this guy, Jeff, has a fever, you can immediately reach out to Jeff and go point to point. And for any kind of large organization where you have 3,000 personnel, you don't care about the 2,997 that are fine. You care about figuring out who are the three people that are in distress and actually need help with this right now. And this is an everyday occurrence in the DOD. Personnel accountability happens every single day across the entire Department of Defense. And it's the kind of thing we also see in other kinds of sectors as well with things like oil field services, construction, mining, anywhere where there's some risk and you want to make sure that your people are okay. And by putting it in the mobile device, it means that that leader has access to this information anywhere they are. And this is something that's really, really important because we've seen that the, the managers and the leaders, they're operating on flight lines, they're operating under the decks of ships, they're operating wherever they are, they actually need access to their organization. They need access to the information and they want this trust that they can reach out and they can touch their people. Yeah, it's kind of wild to think, but you know, basically this type of workforce software doesn't exist yet or it happens in like much more crude ways and it's not in basically infantry level person's phone. In the short term, you think of it as, you know, resource management and things like that, but it's really interesting how this could be sort of that identity layers. Like it's almost like the way Slack is for a lot of organizations. You know, you're just seeing applications being built on top of it, like internal workflows being built on top of Slack. Uh, the same thing will happen with what you have um, with Muster. You know, it's sort of the uh, nervous system. And then once you sort of connect everything up, then that's just the beginning of sort of a super app. It's the fabric of interoperability for these organizations. And so we've seen, I think, from that sort of baseline productivity perspective, where you're providing that communications glue that means that you can communicate and interact in a structured way with your personnel, regardless of where they are, whether they're at home, they're at work, whether they're inside of a building, outside of a building, and using native networks, using AT&T and Verizon, or uh, networks in the Middle East, wherever people are deployed using this, and using the devices that they already have on them, is provide this backbone. And what organizations are seeing is that, hey, now that I can do this, now I want to extend this. And so this is something we've seen play out where the product is going viral across a lot of these organizations. So we have generals referring it to other generals. We have colonels referring it to colonels. And we have enlisted personnel. When they rotate to a new unit, they say, hey, i got to take muster with me. Because they say, hey, every single thing happened in muster in my previous unit. So now we need to do the same thing here. And, and they're also seeing, hey, this can now be adapted to your point around like the identity is that you're providing this sort of this fundamental entity data and this interaction point for people so that if you can see, I can line up my people and I can count my people and interact in a digital way, in a first class way. Now I can say, hey, what about all my equipment? You know, when the DOD says like, I need to make sure I have all my equipment and who's assigned to, to what rifle or who's assigned to what radio and things like that, you need to have the people first. And that's where we see muster is this kind of backbone, not just from a product perspective with the, the workflow, but also the data perspective 
where now you can start to say, hey, like, let's keep track of all of our equipment or all of our vehicles and our maintenance and link it all to it. And that's something we've seen uh, is pushed for expansion. So there's some rapid innovation organizations in the Department of Defense. There's AFWorks with the Air, the Air Force. There's ArcWorks with the National Guard. And, and they're pushing very, very heavily to expand muster to then say, hey, look, if we have all of our people, let's start scheduling our people. And it creates a couple of things we've seen in organizations. One is a culture of engagement where leadership is telling us, hey, we hadn't thought about how technology could impact the way we lead our people. The way they do things they call setting a command climate, which we refer to in the startup world as culture. And thinking about how that affects the interactions with their personnel, where it actually manifests a real open door policy for better or worse. Yet the junior enlisted are actually talking to the senior leaders of a unit and telling them what's going on. It also means that you have this kind of new efficiency where we've seen units that will immediately get some information through muster and issue an order 10 minutes later. And it's flattening a lot of the communications that happens with that. So it means that they're able to get a lot more stuff done and get more training done and more maintenance done. And then also mean that their soldiers and their sailors and their Marines get more time with their families as well, which is something that's really important. And then the third thing that, that we're really excited about is that it changes the expectation. Where a lot of times I remember wearing a uniform, you kind of expect things to be not quite as nice as you would like. The software experience is not quite as nice as you like. The food sometimes is not quite as nice as you would like. And the lodging is not quite as nice as you would like. But now they're saying, hey, look, I can download Muster through the App Store. I can get my organization set up. And it works well. And it improves the quality of our operations. And you know what? I should actually have nice things. And that, I think, is a critical component to be able to actually change the expectation for this innovation ecosystem that delivers new capabilities to the DoD. Yeah, that's the really interesting thing about, I mean, frankly, selling any kind of software to any part of the government is it doesn't cost more. In fact, really good software tends to cost less and it also saves people so much money. And, you know, it's sort of like a, a 10x sort of thing. And that's why Palantir existed. And um, the really interesting new lesson I think you're learning now is that, you know, Palantir was actually maybe a harder thing to sell because it was actually quite a bit more expensive in a lot of ways. And it didn't have like the same kind of motion. Whereas this is a lot more like bottom up. Like, you know, you don't need the full buy-in all the way at the top. You're going to get the full buy-in all the way at the top because the software will have already done what it did for that, um, you know, army br brigade, for instance. Like it will have already done that for, uh, you know, the bottom up. And then it makes it really easy to sell top down. And I think that's like an, a new thing that's really exciting about what you're doing. It's it's something that we've adapted from the Palantir playbook. And I think they deserve a lot of credit because they, they created this shift in the organization where the organization said, hey, it's actually important we have good capabilities and that software is a thing that should be treated slightly differently. But certainly we've adapted that playbook and said, hey, all right, based off of those lessons learned, how would we actually do this? recognizing that as we focus on creating value, where we're creating value for the end user, we're creating value for, for the business, for, for our investors, it's what's the best way of actually going forth and doing that. And, and certainly by making a product that's really, really easy for end users to understand, making it easy for them to buy. And then there's certainly some things that we've done as well to make it easy for the enterprise to buy too. And I, I would be candid in saying that the DOD is still, it is not an easy customer uh, to work with. Um, you know, I think we all know that building software is not an easy thing and uh, building startups is not an easy thing. I think when you look at the DOD, like just even talking to users is a challenge. And, and I, I would say like we were working with some, some Air Force users. And if you think about being able to uncover a problem and actually access the user, you have to figure out a person that has a problem, get in touch with them somehow, get invited to go to a base, fly the, to that location stand outside the gate for an hour, hope that they put the paperwork in to get you on base, get on base. And it's kind of like TSA to the power of 10. And then go find your way to a numbered building when there are no maps because it's uh, the military and they do that for security. And then you've got to get a badge to get into the building. And then you've got to go find your way to the basement and hope that somebody lets you through the locked door to go talk to the person that actually has the problem. So user access is a real challenge. The whole company right now is just a super interesting spot because um, you know Paul Graham would always talk about how you can think of the world as basically a bunch of Venn diagrams of like, here's people who know how to build software. And then here's people who have lived 
your life experience, you know, in spending time in, you know, service to your country. And then also, you know, getting to know a lot of the people who you got to know through Palantir as well. And it's like, basically now there's this once in a while, you, usually these worlds are sort of like separate. And then once in a while, uh, it forms a startup like your startup where there's a union of those things. And then those are the people who can actually create something that builds a billion dollar industry or ten hundred billion dollar industry that, you know, so that's, I guess that's why I'm so excited to, to be working with you because it's just been cool to see that play out over the past few years. You know, I think it's, it's a constant journey, right? Like you talk about, you've done a video, I forget which one it was, but it, it's about finding the value that you can create in the world. And I remember on, on my own journey, being captivated by software early on and going to work in Silicon Valley in the year 2000, right in the middle of the dot-com boom and going to Stanford, which is not a common thing to leave the UK and go to college in the United States at the time. And then when 9-11 happened and I felt this need to serve and I waited till senior year, graduated and enlisted uh, so that I could go join special forces, which is the hardest job that I could sign up for at the time because I wanted to go make an impact. And I remember, I think it was... 2010, I'd, I'd been part of an operation to help stop a bombing in a capital city. And I sort of took a step back and said, okay, well, we, we prevented a terrorist attack. Like how else can I contribute? How else can I create impact? And where else is there leverage, right? And it comes down to product. And so I, I was recruited to go join Palantir and we built some amazing things at Palantir that, that made a real difference for, for the end users. The, the software that we built was used to, to plan the recapture of Iraq from ISIS. And, and created huge, huge enterprise value uh, for Palantir and, and new contracts. And again, I kind of took a step back and said, all right, well, well, how else can you continue to create value? You stopped a bombing, you built some software that the Navy SEALs used to help stop ISIS, like what's next? And I think that's where you, you kind of, uh, you talk about the honey badger approach and you've got to kind of like cut the parachute a little bit, cut away and say, all right, it's time to step into the unknown and, and push the envelope and make sure you're going for it all the time and thinking like, where is that intersection? Where's the middle of that Venn diagram? And and what can I do in the middle of that Venn diagram? And then it just becomes clear at that point. Taking a step back, I mean, one of the things I love to ask people who come on the channel, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people here watching are actually really young early in their careers. And, you know, what advice would you give to, you know, the 20 year old uh, version of yourself? Actually, I think we probably met each other when we were like probably around 20, actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think it was uh, it was probably actually about 20 years ago uh, this month that, that we first met. I guess my first piece of advice would probably be 2009, you're going to throw a hand grenade uh, and you take a knee. Instead, you should lie down uh, oh, better, man. Uh, in all seriousness. And it's something we see across a lot of other founders as well. Is you have a lot of people who are very, very driven. It's important to take a holistic perspective of life and to make sure that as we're focusing on on going and building businesses and learning and acquiring skills and creating value in the world, re remembering that that value extends not just in the professional domain, but also it includes friends and family. And it also includes yourself as well. And if it comes down to, to really making sure that you invest in a holistic way to, to live the best life that you possibly can, because when you create value in the world, it's about creating value for other people. And, and certainly we think about that as users, uh, we think about that with investors but it's also about the way that you can share energy with other people. And it's about the way that you can create positivity and help set an example for others, I think. We're, we're definitely not islands. And then we have so much that we can actually um, do for each other, actually. And I don't know, that's the coolest thing about like making a business period, actually, is exactly that. You know, you go out, you see a problem, you go and solve that problem. And then in the process, you actually need people. And so you can make a great place for people to work. I mean, it's about making systems that, you know, ideally make the whole system better. And, um, and that's what you're doing. So I'm pretty excited about that. Some closing thoughts might be around what was it like to be able to look at Palantir so early when there was sort of that first sub hundred thousand dollar contract or, you know, sort of through even like making 80,000 a month or something, but then to be able to grow that 10 or a hundred X is just you know, that's something that you were able to do. And what was the most surprising thing? What was the thing that really just stood out to you from that experience and the experience that you're seeing right now? 
I think there was like a very, very deeply iterative approach. I mean, I remember when everyone in, in BD and Washington, DC sat around the same table together. I think what we were acutely conscious of is that it was a huge team effort. You have guys like Doug Philippone, you have uh, everyone that's pushing so hard to try and create create this better reality for software. In that case, it was in the intelligence, the operations space. It took a huge team effort. It was hugely iterative. And it was very much, it would, you would just walk into a wall and find out hey, what's the, where's the doorway? I'm just going to keep walking into the walls until I can find a doorway. And, and what we saw is that there's, there's a lot of physics to the actual marketplace. There's dynamics that you can actually harness that you can then use as a lever to, to magnify your message, to magnify your reach and actually create access across the organization and create adoption and, and create demand as well. And ultimately that demand is what brings better products into the marketplace. And so I think seeing that grow it was a it was a long journey, but I think it was also an amazingly fulfilling one. That makes a ton of sense. Taking a step back, Addyton is hiring. I guess what's the best way for people to sort of get involved? Addyton.io. Yep, absolutely. There's a form on the website. If if you want to join our team, then uh, you can go right there, drop your contact information in, and um, we're absolutely looking for really really passionate front end developers, uh, looking for full stack developers. We're building a whole team. And then I would also include, uh, we're looking in particular for, for veterans who have a lot of end user empathy with an eye for product. And there's some amazing people that, that we know from our past experience, um, but we're looking for people who say, hey, look, like I want this to be better. They got to feel it in their bones that they want this to be better. And we're pairing those people up with engineers who just have this love for creating product with mobile technology, who love like the edge cases uh, delightful to them. You know, it's a challenge for them. It's a puzzle. And so if there are folks who have a strong sense of purpose, who want to work in a high performing team environment, we have a team first culture and who are thinking about their career opportunities and, you know, are, are seeing there's the next, there's the next cat picture messaging application. There's the next ad tech thing. And if they want to build software that people use every single day to, to go fight wildfires, to, to go, um, move people around in the Middle East to, to go keep people safe, uh, then we're a place where you can actually combine your creativity with product, with a sense of mission, and really build value that has impact. James, thanks a lot for coming on the channel. And I mean, thank you for letting us invest and be a small part of uh, this very, very big and important journey. Gary, thank you for the adventure.